Hello and welcome to this um, webinar from NMIS Skills. I'm Lewis Rolfs and sitting to my right is... John Casey. Yeah, we're both from City of Glasgow College, as you may be able to tell. Uh, and this is obviously part of the NMIS Skills project. So today we're going to be looking at uh, a few things, mainly to do with um, online collaboration. So, John, do you want to describe yourself a bit? Because this is the first time you've been on one of these yeah, webinars. The first time I've been on the new telly here. Um, <laughs> my name's John, John Casey. I'm a senior learning technologist here at the City of Glasgow College. And I specialize in projects, uh, inventive uses of technology. And currently, we're doing a project on blockchain, which is very trendy at the moment. <laughs> and if you want to check that out, you can visit my, myskills.org.uk. Yeah. So a bunch of my projects. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna start my screen share and then I will bring up uh, the presentation for today and we'll get started. So what we're gonna be looking at today is all about, come on, there we go, finally got there. We're all gonna be looking about basically uh, present, uh, ugh, about online collaboration. I'm losing my words already. You can tell it's a Friday. Yeah. Um, so we're gonna be looking at how different ways that you can kind of collaborate with colleagues or your students using online tools, which can unlock some really amazing abilities to do group work uh, with a lot of people. So let's have a look at what our learning objectives are for today. We're gonna to develop inclusive practice and engagement with students and colleagues. And we're also gonna learn how to facilitate collaborative work with a variety of tools. That's the first time I've been able to successfully say them without stumbling over the words. Mm. Usually not my strong point in reading, but um, we will press onwards. So um, first thing we're going to talk about is online forums, which are things that have been around for a long time. The idea of a forum, mm. as you can see in the pitch in the presentation here, this is a forum from somewhere in Jordan during the Roman era. These originally came and it originally meant a kind of a marketplace. So then it became a place where people would gather to share ideas. And that's how we use the word nowadays especially in online forums. The idea is to present a space where people can get together, they can chat about things. And one of the real big advantages of the online ones is that it's asynchronous. So you don't always have to be online at the same time with like say a webinar. People can choose to engage when they've got the time to go and engage with the um, discussion that's happening. Um, so you can do them in a variety of ways. You can have it where there's an initial post that's guiding people on what to do, which is how we do them in, in our NMIS skills. Um, as you'll see later on, there'll be a prompt to get people started thinking and chatting on the forum later. Um, or you can just do it as a general discussion and question and answer kind of session. So you could set one up so your students can ask you questions and then people can all see the answers. So you've got a general kind of like FAQ, frequently asked questions type mm. format. So you can use them for a bunch of different things. Um, one thing you can also do with them is use them um, as part of your assessment process. So you can start a discussion on there and then people will be required to join in and then you can mark them based on a bunch of criteria. So it could be like the accuracy, if it's useful, um, spelling, if you're really going down that route, if you're maybe doing a language course. Um, a, a ton of different factors that are appropriate to what you're doing. And it, it can be very useful. Like, have you used forums much, Sean? Yeah, I've, I've used forums, I've set up forums. Um, they're a bit old school now in uh, learning technology, but actually like a lot of things, some of the old stuff is still pretty good. So if you think it through carefully, you can make a lot of good use of forums. So for instance, if you're doing a bit of blended learning, uh, which is very fashionable at the moment, um, it's a good way of keeping a group of people together. So here's a hot tip for using um, forums as part of your blended learning strategy. Blended learning, by the way, just means your students are working outside the class, uh, not in the class all the time, uh, and you're giving them things to do. It's as old as the hills, it's the old idea of homework. But um, if you've got a cohort of students that are not always with you, um, you can use that to keep in touch with them and give them things to do. And a really good tip, if you've got really distance learners, is if you can afford it, is to get the people in together face to face for a kickoff session. And after that, when they collaborate online, they'll, so, they'll know who they're collaborating with. And that is money in the bank for blended learning. Yeah, it's a very good idea. Um, so uh, one quick discussion as well, see if you guys who are at home or probably at work actually, <laughs> given the time, mm. have any ideas. So have you used forums in the past? What was good about them? Um, did you have any struggles with them? Uh, I'll get the chat opened up here and I'll see what people are saying. Um, but yeah, just give us your kind of impressions of them. I can get the chat to open. It's not going to open for me. Give me one second. I'm just going to have to 
quit out of that full screen and see if I can get it to come up. Um, I do put stuff in there. Um, okay, I've managed to get my hands on the chat again. So, um, so uh, let's see. So one of the uh, people that's saying it was difficult to get people to participate sometimes. Yeah, it can be. And that's where that kind of idea of maybe having a mark forum can come in. If you do make it part of the assessment process, that can give that kind of impetus to get people involved. I recently did a, a Creative Commons course online and um, it started off where the, the, the kind of discussion parts were mandatory. Um, and there was only a few of us who were really discussing things. But the second they put on that kind of, actually you'll be getting 10% of your mark, it was quite low. It wasn't um, like, you know, breaking the, the, the structure by putting it in. Um, that then people really had that little impetus to get started. And once they got started, they would engage more and more. They weren't just doing the bare minimum. They would actually try and, and actually participate in the, uh, the discussions. So yeah. Another um, hot tip as, as well is to manage expectations. Mm -hmm. So when you set the forum up, don't be vague. It, it, depending on your students as well, um, the, some student groups might need more direction and structure than others. So you could set up even specific, specific times for people to be online to collaborate. It's an odd use of a forum, so it's semi-synchronous, and there's a bit of research that shows if people feel that people are around uh, in time terms, in relatively few minutes, they'll perform quite differently. So if you give your students times and activities to do in the forum, it can help a lot. So don't, don't leave it just vague. You need structure in the forum just like um, you do in the class. Yeah, very, very, very good point there. Um, and, and also, like, it, it depends on the, what you're using the forum for as well. If you are just using it for a question and answer kind of thing, then it might be actually quite good if there's no questions there. Maybe you've been really amazing at conveying mm -hmm. what you're doing in the course to people. But if you are kind of using it as a discussion point, you do want to have that structure for sure. Um, okay, I don't think anyone else has got any other comments right now. So we'll, we'll push on because we've got quite a bit to cover today, actually. So let me just start screen sharing again and we'll see what we're covering next. So we're now gonna look at a few remote team working tools. So these are tools that are really useful if you're working with uh, on a project which people are in different organizations. So you might be working between colleges or that's what John does a lot of is working with people who are in different universities yeah. or yeah. colleges. Um, or it could be people who are in your same um, institution, but they might not be physically nearby. They might be on a different floor and then it's getting a pain to go up and speak to them or it's just emails aren't quite what you need. So the first thing we're going to look at is a tool called Slack. Um, now this has become quite a popular tool. Let me just see if I can get it open. Um, Cause it allows you to basically communicate via an instant message style client. So you can just type things instantly to speak to people. And you can also use it to share files. So I'll just bring up this example here, which is quite simple. Um, that um, one of my colleagues, Munmeet here, has shared a banner that he was working on with me. I'll just show it here. It's very, very cool. Good work, Munmeet. Um, and I needed to get the file from him. And because it was bigger than our email would allow, he could just send it to me via Slack. Very, very nice and simple. It can give me a bit of information. And similarly, someone talking about some <coughs> of the things that were happening with our servers. Um, and you can also have direct messages. So if we wanted to, I'll go back to the one from Munmeet as well, because I know this one's not got any private information in it. Um, again, he was sending me the banner there through a private message. So if you want to send a file only to that one person or just have a private chat with them, you can. Mm -hmm. Similarly, you can create group chats where multiple people can uh, engage. And it can also do um, video calling. So that's also a very great feature. And it's got a very good search feature as well. So if you're looking for stuff, you can find them. Yeah. And also, it can uh, take integration. So here we've integrated with our Google Drive to tell us when people are sharing folders and, and when they're not. Yeah. Uh, I'll just go away from that. To ask good, them good for project work, especially between institutions. Yeah, it's a really good tool. Um, we don't have time to fully go into it. And um, I don't want to dig too much into this because there are some information there that people might not want me to share. Um, so it's a very useful tool if, you, if you're kind of just looking to uh, be able to communicate with people nice and easily and quickly. Um, it, it's kind of, I think it's very intuitive because it is, you're just typing messages. It does have some really advanced features with a thing called Slack bot where you can like set reminders, you can communicate in, with it by a kind of program line style interface. Because the Slack was originally invented yeah. by some uh, video game developers who were having trouble working together on a distributed project. 
Um, there's a similar thing that uh, Microsoft has as well called Teams. Um, mm. And if you're on Office 365, you'll, you'll have access to that and that behaves in a very similar way to Slack. Uh, I'll say today we're gonna be covering tools that are all free to use um, for private users and a lot of them are also free to use for business as well. Um, so that's why we're not looking at the Microsoft solutions because you have to pay for yeah. them. Yeah. Um, so we want to try and make this as available to everyone, but I'll, I'll point them out where there is a Microsoft one as well. So the next thing we're going to look at is Trello, which is a kind of um, virtual task card system. I don't know the best way to describe Trello. It's very useful. Basically, you can create these, these cards. So here we have, I've got to do, doing, done. These are, this is an old board of mine, which has some old things I was working on, where I can go through and I can create a card. Here we go, I've got my checklist of things I need to do. Um, and then I can assign it to members who are on the board. I can add labels and colors. So let's say I wanna make this one green, so now it's a green one, so you can visually organize them. And then these cards can be moved around, so I can move this to do, or maybe when it's done, it moves over here. And then you can have little checklists on it, so you can see how close the task is to do. Put on deadlines. You put stickers on things to help organize things. And it's just—it's quite good for as a lightweight kind of project management tool. So you can see what tasks people are working on. Mm. You can assign them to certain people. So this yeah. is me being assigned to it. And that's one of my colleagues, Sebastian, there, who was assigned to it as well. It's very um, visual. Yeah, it's very good for that. And it's just a nice, simple way of doing project management or any kind of task management. Mm. You can also use it if, um, as a kind of assessment tool as well, because you could ask your students to go and make a Trello board where they're bringing together a bunch of ideas and, and showing how they interrelate relate or categorizing them. So you can use it in that assessment side as well. Um, where it really shines is in this kind of remote team working kind of project management aspect. Mm. Um, and again, it's a free tool to use. So you yeah. can go and set it yeah. up. And also it's worth remembering these are all communication and collaboration tools, but they won't make people collaborate well unless you've got the basics in place. So good yeah. structures, uh, good frameworks to work within, and be nice to people. Yeah. <laughs> it's, as with all the technology, I think it's a good point you're making there, is like the technology is there to facilitate things. It's not the solution, yeah. as it were. Like a lot of people get in trouble because they think we'll bring this technology and all our problems will go away. You still have to do the back end of organizing things in as fact, well. It's, it's not just going to be magic. Yeah, there's a good tip here as well that we've got to develop later on about the, the digital trail that people leave. If you're in a situation where there's poor communication, this is not a cure for it. This could actually make it worse. Mm -hmm. so yeah. Just remember that. If you're confusing multiple channels, it's like it's a good idea to have a specific, this is the channel we yeah. use so people aren't spreading communications all over the place. So that's worth bearing in mind when choosing any of these solutions. The final one we're going to look at is called Padlet, which is kind of a bit similar to Trello. I'll just show you how it looks. Um, and it, it basically allows you to create these little kind of sticky notes type things, like you're arranging things on a notepad. And you can um, then create really good little presentations of information or organize ideas. So in this case, it's a really good one about educational ways to use Padlet. So there's a bunch of ideas that you can um, think about using this tool. Um, and yeah, it, 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 I think this one's particularly good for using for students. You can ask them to go away and make a padlet of ideas. So if you're brainstorming, say, ideas for uh, a design of some sort of, um, let's go with interior design, that's a good example, where you're going to be bringing together some images of fabrics, some um, furniture you might want to use in there. You can put it all in this padlet. So you've got this nice kind of, um, uh, kind of portfolio almost mm. of, of what you're going to build up, a, a scrap board. Or, um, that's probably yeah, what it is. Scrap scrapbook. Book. Scrapbook, yeah. that's the word I'm looking for, I'm yeah, struggling for. So it's, it's very useful for doing that. Um, and there's a whole bunch of ideas on here of ways you can use it as well. Um, you can use it for workflows in a similar way to uh, Trello of having a do to do done board. Um, and using it in that way, I won't go into too much detail with this one because it's quite similar to Trello, but it's just kind of make you aware that it's there mm. as well. It's like an even lighter weight version of Trello. Mm. So very easy for your students to use. Um, so that's worth going and have a look at. And all the, the, the slides for this presentation will be online. So if you want the links to these things, they're all in the uh, presentation. So um, it's very good stuff, that. So let's have a look at some other things as well. So let me just bring just, up. Just uh, on the reference thing. section of the slides, you'll find yes. links to all these tools. So at the end of each uh, presentation, the, on the slides, there's, there's links to all these tools. Yeah, exactly. Uh, 
So we were talking about forums earlier. Um, we've kind of brought a few collaborative tools through there, some ideas um, to get you started. But if you go onto our forums on nmis-skills.org, go to the community section and forums, you'll be able to sign up to our uh, Google group. Uh, all you need for that is your own personal Google account, and then you can sign up for the group, and then you can get involved in the discussions. And a kind of starter prompt, as we were talking about scaffolding, mm. frameworking the discussions, yeah. is what we want to know is what other collaborative tools do you use? Because there are probably a bunch of things that you're using that I might not have even heard of, because mm. um, there are a lot of different tools out there. Um, so we'd like you to, to kind of discuss them and, and tell us what you found was really good about them, things you might have struggled with, because other people might have had similar problems, will be able to bring solutions or just a good list of, of good tools for other people to use, because that's, mm. that's the best way of finding out about these things, is asking people and seeing yeah. their experiences. Yeah. Or even have a think about what tasks would you like to do, and mm. ask other folks if they've got any tools that would fit the task. Exactly, that's the best way of doing it. Don't just go and try and grab, grab Slack, because it looks cool. Have a reason you, you need to use it, yeah. and, then, and then fit it into your workflows. Always work like that. It's the same way we were talking about the learning design Always think about what your learning and objective is, and then pick the technology that fits it. Never the other way around. Because that's where you start to run into trouble. And take the time to uh, investigate the tool. Don't jump into it too quickly. Yeah. Give yourself time. Indeed, indeed. Um, so what we're going to have a look at now is a bunch of the tools that are present within Google, and they're kind of Google Docs, um, greater ecosystem, shall we call yeah. it. Um, <clears throat> and also kind of talk a little bit about G Suite. I'll, I'll mention at the start here that a lot of the tools that we're going to show here, there are equivalent ones in um, Microsoft Office 365. Uh, again, as I said, we won't be showing those because uh, we're focusing on ones that are free, and all these Google tools are free um, for private users or if you have G Suite for education, so free to educational users. Uh, if you are a private enterprise, you would have to pay for G Suite. Uh, I'm not too sure of the prices for that, but I think it's a similar thing to 365. Yeah, it's about three pound a user per year, I think it is. Yeah, so not bad. It's used very widely in the corporate sector, and this is not necessarily a recommendation, it's used by the United Kingdom government. Mm -hmm. And also worth bearing in mind is these tools are in use by uh, all the schools in Scotland. Well, not all of them. Most of the schools in Scotland have access to G Suite and the Google tools. So if you're thinking about <laughs> developing your workforce, for example, and thinking what skills they're going to come in with, a lot of them will already have used uh, G Suite at school if they've just come through the Scottish system. Yeah, yeah. So that's worth bearing in mind. Um, so a couple of things about G Suite, um, or I should say Google tools. Uh, they're all integrated, so they work really nicely. When you've got one account, you've got access to all of them. You don't need to create separate accounts. If you are in a G Suite instance, you are GDPR compliant, fully GDPR compliant. So that's really nice to know. That's got all your workers are protected uh, um, from any problems with that, those kind of um, uh, obligations. Yeah, so this is probably a good time to point out that in Scotland, uh, the G Suite for education is not widely used in further and higher education, which is a bit of a shame potentially, because it's free and it's very powerful. And one of the, sometimes people object to the idea of it because they think it's not GDPR compliant. So if you are thinking about uh, getting G Suite in your institution, be assured it is. It is, yeah. Um, so we're gonna have a look at a few of the tools that it provides and kind of what they can do. So first of all, we're gonna have a look at Google Drive. So what I'll do is I'll just jump over to my Google Drive. I'll close a couple of things so my tabs aren't going to get in the way. I just have to wait for Zoom to stop covering up my tabs. There we go. So Google Drive, um, very similar to OneDrive, if you've got experience with that. It's an online hard drive. That's the way to think about it. Mm -hmm. So instead of going to your My Documents on your computer and saving things there, instead you go to drive.google.com and you save things there. And one of the advantages of that is no matter where you are, you have access to your documents as long as you've got an internet connection. Mm. Or if you use um, Sync, you can have them working offline as well. Excuse me. <coughs> Pardon me, give me one second for some more. And another good thing to remember about Google Drive, and sometimes people overlook this, is unlimited storage for educational use per user. And I mean unlimited storage. So Oops. we know of colleagues who've reached several petabytes of data in their personal account. And Google is still saying, yeah, come on, I'm not full up yet. Yeah. That's a massive uh, thing to consider for education. 
Yeah, it's, it's a very big thing. I'll just say if people are trying to send messages in the chat, for some reason it's not letting me open them at the moment because it's tried to pop up a couple of notifications for me. But once we're finished talking about Drive, I'll, I'll jump out of the screen share and I'll see what the messages are. So there will be time for some more discussions later. Do not worry. Um, yeah, so one of the basic things with Drive is obviously we can dump our uh, full folders, files here, so I can store all my files. But what you can also do is share them. So let's say I wanted to share this Equatio demo with John. All I need to do is right click on it, hit the share option, and then because we're both on Gene's feed, it'll know his email address when I start typing John. So there we go. Um, I can then invite him to um, collaborate on it. Uh, anyone's email address you can put in there. Um, and you can also do a thing called getting a shareable link, which allows you to grab a link which you can send to anyone and then they can go and view your document, edit it, or comment on it. So you've got a really good fine-grained control of what you want people to be able to do with your documents. Mm -hmm. Also, if you have G Suite, you have control over whether it can be shared with people um, publicly on the web, anyone with a link, or only people within your G Suite, so within your company. So if you're uh, maybe one of the IT people in your company and you're worried about the fact that suddenly people can start sending stuff to outside things, you can have data leaks mm -hmm. all over the shop, you can shut that down. You can restrict it so that people can only share with people inside the college. This is, that's a high level admin thing as well. You can choose which of these options people have access to. So that's a really good feature of it. It it's, gives you really good control over it. <clears throat> and basically, once a document's shared, um, it will appear in your shared with me section. So here's a bunch of ones that people have shared with me. What you could also do with um, Drive is create team drives. Now these are kind of um, a drive where a bunch of people can access documents together. So we've created one for our project and anyone who's got access to that can edit all the documents that are inside it or you can set it so that they can only view all the documents inside it. Um, really, really useful yeah. for doing collaborative stuff because suddenly I can go, oh John, I've worked on the template for this, go and have a look, it's on the drive and then John can instantly open it up, start editing it. Yeah, And you can restrict access to each of these team drives and there are a bit for those of you who are in mm -hmm. institutions, you've probably got network drive folders. It's the same idea, only this is in the cloud. Um, and again, you can access it anywhere. Yeah, it's, 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 it's not tied down to your institutional campus. It's very, very useful, especially if you're going out a lot to like conferences or stuff like that, where you still want access to your documents. Mm -hmm. Very, very useful solution. So what we'll show you now is we talked about sharing documents. There's also some collaborative features with documents themselves. <coughs> now, earlier on, John created me a, 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 a Google Doc, um, and he shared it with me. So here we go. This is in my shared with me. I don't own this document. I can, in fact, show you that I don't own it by opening the sidebar and show you that the document is John is the owner, mm. and I have access as a contributor. So what I will do is I'll... Woo, I'll wait for Zoom to allow me to see my tabs again. Go away Zoom, there we go. Um, I'll open the document, here it is. So you can see it looks like a kind of a normal uh, Google document. John, if you wanna start typing, I'll just show you I'm not using my hands here and you'll see things start appearing on my screen because John is actually typing. His name in here is still admin admin for some reason, it's not updated his name. Let me just sure. refresh to see if it'll give him his correct name. Um, so I'm just telling you about my really nice camper van yes, that so, I've been showing my colleagues today yeah. also. <laughs> so we can see now we've got John's correct name. Um, <clears throat> small glitch there. Um, but you can see he was typing there and I can see him typing in real time. So we can do some collaborative stuff. So John, if you want to keep typing, um, I'm going to actually say it's not a really nice camper van. It's a really good camper van. So I've edited what he was doing. I can then come in here. I can go, oh, okay, we actually want this text to be bolded. So we can start working on the same document at the same time. Yeah. It's, it's quite amazing. If, for, for, if you've not had access to a tool like this before, it can really change things. Yeah. It suddenly goes from, oh, I've got this copy. Do you have the same version? Oh, no, I've got the old version. Right, okay, send me it. I'll put them together. <laughs> now that's the new, oh, someone else has done an edit of their copy. That all goes away. So if you're used to doing this kind of thing with Word and sending it backwards and forwards, um, this is quite a, a culture change. It takes a while to get used to it, but once you get into the headspace, really useful for collaborative writing. Yeah, indeed. It's, it's so many amazing things that this can do as well. And it's not just about being able to collaboratively work together. We can also got a bunch of other features which can change things as well. So what I'll show you now is version history. I mentioned this slightly in a couple of 
um, webinars before, but we've not fully done it. What you can see here is it's now highlighting the things that different people have done. So you can see John's stuff is in green, my stuff is in purple. So you can see I changed the good part of it um, and John wrote all this green. So if you're using this as an assessment tool and you've got multiple students working on the same document, you can go in here and see who edited what. So that can be a really great way of, you don't have that problem again of the, the group hands in the work and you mm, was this all just mm. their work or did they actually work as a, a, a team or was it just mm. one person? So you can see, so you can then go, right, okay, Jimmy, you didn't do anything, Sarah did all the work um, and give them a really individual um, grade. But what this also allows us to do is if I um, click on this tab here, what we can do is we see that now it's telling me that I deleted nice and good was put in. I can click on this one and you can see now it's gone back a version. It's now gone to where John had a really nice camper van. What I can do is hit this button, restore this version, mm. restore, and you'll see it then jumps back to that version. So if someone goes into your document and changes things in a way that you didn't want, um, stuff gets deleted by mistake, you can go into that version history and you can either copy and paste stuff out of the version history or you can restore it to a previous version, which is really an amazing feature and it's it very, is, very usable. It is. Another good use of this uh, facility is not just group work, it's a student portfolio system that we're investigating here at the college. So the student can be working away in a Google Doc or whatever other Google tool and they can share it with a tutor and at some point the tutor can come in and make comments, give guidance. And then at some point the tutor can take a copy, like a, a freeze copy of mm -hmm. that bit of work that then is owned by the tutor and then they can mark that bit of work and they keep the digital evidence with it. Yeah. So from a portfolio point of view, it's, it's pretty powerful. Yeah, there's lots of amazing things you can do with this. You can also name the versions as well. So I could call this one correct version obviously give them better descriptive names so you can easily find where things are done so you could do first draft or you could say um if you suddenly decide oh we need to change the way this is structured and we want to move it all around you can name something old structure and then if you suddenly decide oh no it worked better that way you can move back to it. R really really powerful tool if you've not used that before um what we'll also show you as well is these collaborative tools are in a lot of um the Google tools. So what I'll do here is I'll insert a slide. And then if John, do you want to start trying to work on that slide that I just inserted? It should be number 10. Number 10. Yeah. Here so I we'll so see. There we go. Still. My writing is terrible. Right? <laughs> to go camping. So, yes, I'm obsessed. <laughs> so we Spell can both well. kind of work on the, on the slides collaboratively as well, which is very useful for, for working on a presentation as a team. A very, very useful tool. So this is present in a lot of the Google tools. It's in Sheets as well, which is their equivalent of Excel. Um, and similarly, we've got the share buttons like we had on the drive, so I can share this with individual people or give access to um, everyone in the world with a link. Um, so all these tools are kind of built in. And while we're talking about Google Slides, I'm gonna show you another quite amazing tool. Just gonna move myself up a little bit and then I'm gonna hit this caption button. Okay, and then the mic will be able to pick up what I'm saying and automatically write captions at the bottom of the screen. This is a very useful tool if you have people in your class who have maybe hearing problems or if you're presenting to a very large audience in a room that does, have not good, does not have good acoustics. So it will automatically caption these things. You can also set it to translate um, the language as well. So you can use it as a kind of semi-translation facility. Obviously with any automatic translator, don't rely on it being super accurate. But it'll be able to pick up voices. That's amazing, totally amazing. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's very, very cool. So you can use this as well in Google Docs, can use this um, feature to do voice typing as yeah, well. and it works really well. It does, it's incredible. Another feature you could use this for is if you're recording a screencast, which we'll be doing a webinar on later. Um, you can use this to automatically generate your captions and record that into the screencast so you've got a caption built in, so you don't have to worry about transcribing it later. Very, very useful feature. I'm just gonna turn that off because we're gonna be jumping out of um, slides again in a second. Um, but we can see that there's a, a whole load of very, very useful collaborative features 
built into these Google um, tools. So the Google Docs is what they're called, and Docs mm. comprises, um, you've got Docs itself, which is your word editor, Slides, which is your equivalent to PowerPoint, um, Sheets, which is equivalent to Excel, uh, what else is in there? Google Forms, which we talked about earlier, mm. and there's some other tools. There's just, I mean, it's also just worth making the point that to get your, you can get your existing content into Google Docs. Yeah. All you have to do is upload to your drive, and then when it's in the Google Drive, uh, you open, say, your Word document or your PowerPoint slide, and you'll be then given the option to open it in what they call Google Docs. And when you do that, it creates a copy in yeah. the Google format. And the other great thing about this is you can use Google Docs, Google uh, Drive, as a format translation mechanism. So you can download your stuff in different formats. Mm -hmm. So the list goes on. Yeah, it's, uh, I'll, I can quickly show you here. If I go to download as, we can get it in PowerPoint, o ODP, PDF, plain text, just as images, um, lots of different options for being able to export your documents. It's very, very powerful. Um, so the next one we're gonna have a quick look at is called Google Keep. Now, if you're familiar with Microsoft OneNote, this is kind of like a <clears throat> lightweight version of that. And what Keep does is it allows you to basically keep notes. So here we are, some notes that I'd already created. Maybe I want to start a new one uh, called NMIS Skills. So there's my title. I then want to, oh, sorry, my title should be up here. Skills. Uh, so I want to say NMIS Skills is really good. So I've got my note there, and here we go. So I've got little notes. So I can quickly type things like that. You can do drawings in here as well, and you can do notes with images, so you can quickly put images in. What you can also do, let's just do a search for lurchers, one of my favorite breeds of dogs. Um, got lots of amazing pictures of dogs here, so we wanna find one that's really, really good. I think this one's adorable. It's a little dog running around with this toy. Let's, let's visit that image. So open image, new tab, we'll quickly do that. So here we are, beautiful image of a little puppy running around with his favorite toy. Oh, um, we want to save this image for later. We want to make sure we've got this link so we don't lose it when we're looking for it again. I just installed a, a little plugin onto my Chrome browser here called Save to Keep. I just right click, go Save Image to Keep. Uh, it's going to want me to sign in for some reason. I can then uh, take a note. I'll give it a title, Lurcher. Oops, I can't spell, lurcher puppy. And I can take a note, oh. Uh, and it will then save that to keep. So if I go back to keep, we'll see now I've got a link to this image. So it'll always keep a link to the image, it won't save the actual image itself, which is useful for one specific reason, which is that it, you're then not violating copyright. You're not taking a copy of the image, you're just saving a link so you can reference it later. So very good tool for avoiding mistakenly breaching copyright by copying images that you didn't, don't have permission to. Um, but it also allows you to save web links as well in a similar way, so you mm. can start building up these links. Now, you might be thinking, oh, that's quite good, it's got notes, um, but something like OneNote has already got, I, I use that for that already. Google Keep does one other thing which is very, very useful, is that it integrates itself into, um, oh, the chat just decided to show up for me finally. Um, it integrates into, the um, Google Docs uh, environment as well. So here I am back in our Google Doc. You see on my sidebar here, I've got Keep. If I open up Keep, you can see suddenly I've got all these notes I was taking. And what I can just do is just click and drag, and I can start inserting them into my document. So I can start building up these notes that I'm gonna later then work mm. on. And it's similarly, that's also present in my slides. Yeah. So I can use them there as well. So it's a very useful tool for um, taking notes and then reusing them. Mm -hmm. So it could be that you've got some bit of boilerplate text that you use quite a lot, keep it and keep, then just drag it into any documents that you're using. Mm -hmm. It might be an intro you like putting at the start of one of your, your topics or something like that. Yeah, so if you're designing a lesson or writing something, you can use it as a scratch pad just to jot down ideas yeah, it's, and then drop it into another Google Doc. It's a very useful tool. Uh, right, we've only got five minutes left, so no. let's, let's quickly move on and we'll talk about Jamboards now as well. This is a relatively new tool, um, but what it basically is, it's like an interactive whiteboard. So 
Have you got your Jamboard open there, John? I do, yeah. So uh, I've already invited John to this one. So um, he's still called Admin Admin, so I'll just give it a rename. We renamed John recently, so his name yeah, uh, I, is... I like the old name. <laughs> so do you want to start doodling away there, John? Yeah, so I've got, um, um, I've got to select my pen yeah. and start drawing. And you'll see in a second it'll start appearing on my screen. There we go. Sure. And you can see him drawing in action. Um, so what this is quite useful for is if you can use it as a kind of a brainstorming tool. So you could have it in a meeting, say, where you want people to be able to jot down notes. They can also, if I move my video out of the way of the toolbar, you'll see them all. You can also do like a sticky note or a post-it note. This is a note. I was like my literal demonstrations. So there we go. You can see we've got a sticky note that's now on, on the table. You can uh, add in images. So let's grab one from my drive. Here we go. Here's the NMIS logo. So we can start putting in things like this and then collaborating on them together. Mm -hmm. um, very useful for like visualizing things because we can also start a background. We can have uh, grids on there. So we can actually use it for quickly sketching out designs or you could even like quickly sketch out an electronic circuit if you're trying to describe it to someone. Very useful for that to kind of collaborative demonstrating visually in meetings or in group work for, for um, classes as well. You could get a group in your class to collaborate on a Jamboard, bring some ideas together, doing a brainstorm, you can do a spider diagram, however you want to use it. And then you can save these Jamboards. So I can download it as a PDF, save it as an image. So we can then use that as part of our assessment process. We've got that evidence as well, because all of these tools allow you to export it. So you've permanently got that evidence so people can't come and edit it later. Yeah. Don't worry, there's ways you can stop that. So it's quite a good tool. Um, we're really starting to run low on time. So what I will quickly say, is that we have our teaching challenge for today, um, which is what we'd like you to do to get you just giving these things a go instead of just hearing about it and then leaving it on the shelf for ages, is to go out and try one of these Google tools or your equivalent in Office 365, if you've got uh, access to that, with one of your students or your colleagues. Just go out and give them a go. Create a shared document. Maybe start working on a shared resource for one of your classes with one of your colleagues. Um, and just get working on it together. Mm. Um, so you can kind of give that a go. Just go and give it a go now. Try it out. A lot, there's lots of good help things in, for Google Docs. If you just type whatever you're stuck with into Google, it will come up. Similarly with Microsoft Help, both very good. Yeah. Never underestimate those help docs. Um, don't really have time for discussion uh, today, sadly, because we we're so busy talking about the amazing tools. But if you do have questions or want to discuss anything, jump onto the forums. All the discussion is available there as well. Um, these are the credits for the session today for all the open um, resources that I used to make it. And uh, we'll have our next session hopefully soon and you'll be able to join in. So thanks for coming along and um, spending some time with us. Thanks. Bye.